welcome everyone. Nice to see you on here. I'm very excited about today's talk. My name is Mikey Menda. I'm the executive director of Africa. I am uh, honored to introduce our special guest. Dr. Mona Karim is the author of three poetry collective collections. She is a 2021 NEA Grant Fellow. Her most recent publication, Femme Ghost, is a trilingual chapter book published by Publication Studios in fall of 2019. Her work has been translated into nine languages and has appeared in Brooklyn Rail, Mich Michigan Quarterly, and the LA Review of Books, as, as well as many other places. Mona has held fellowships and residencies at places including Princeton University, Poetry International, Arab American National Museum, and many others. She's been a featured writer at festivals and conferences in Cairo, Istanbul, Berlin, Amsterdam, Brussels, and a lot of other places. She holds a PhD in comparative literature from SUNY uh, at Birmingham, uh, Binghamton, and her research focuses on contemporary Arab feminist literature. She's taught at Princeton, University of Maryland, College Park, and SUNY Binghamton, Rutgers, and Bronx Community College. Mona, welcome to Africa Conversations. Hi, Mikey. Thank you for having me. One of the things that I did not mention in your bio is that you are the holder of the best eyeglasses collection of anyone who has been interviewed on this series. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I'll accept this honor. <laughs> okay. Please add that to your bio. Yeah. Um, Mona, I, I was telling you before the call that I love speaking to poets because I feel like poetry is an act of distillation and trying to bring things down to their, their, um, their core. And it just leads to, a, like, I don't know what it is about it, but it, I feel like poets are, have a, a clarity that leads to like a lightness. Every poet that I've introduced on the, interviewed on the series is like light and friendly and fun, but their work is so heavy. Yeah. <laughs> do you find that as well for you? Like, do you feel a sense of lightness despite dealing with really heavy topics in your, in your work? Um, yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, uh, what, you, what you sense about poetry is something, um, you know, one of the powers of poetry is that it's, it's, it's against time and it's against uh, whatever changes in, in pace uh, of life, you know. So, like, I, I noticed, for example, how many artists of different genres struggled when the pandemic happened because they're not used to, you know, um, keep in distance from uh, such experiences and then how do you tackle them, you know, but this for us as poets, I feel like is like part of our craft, you know, um, how to resist time and then how to revisit like, um, as you said, distilling experience, right? Like there is um, definitely we sit with that process and then, you know, you sit with that feeling or experience and all you get out of it maybe is one poem, but <laughs> that poem becomes like the name to your feeling and it becomes like, I always look back at poems and I precisely remember how it felt, you know, how it, like what idea I was trying to get into. So yeah, I hope like this, this is a, a good break for you from, <laughs> from all the heavy conversations. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, it's really nice. Yeah. It's almost like, it's like a scent, like really triggers, triggers, time memory, uh, sort of location memory and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk about um, uh, writing in general and when you started writing, but one of the things as I was doing research for today's um, presentation or conversation was, I love that you still have a blog spot. <laughs> and it is active and it has the best bio of any blog spot I've ever come across. Um, <laughs> Was there a public forum where you shared your your poetry or your writing online before this Blogspot account? When did you start publishing online, allowing for people to comment? Your, your comment section is open. Like every single thing on there has comments. Yeah. When did you start allowing people to comment on, on your work? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I had considered leaving, you know, like this space because, you know, as like we've seen in the past 10 years, like, uh, the blog is dead, but the so social media is now like, um, the dominant thing. People are wondering if social media will, will disappear. I feel like, um, I find it very exciting that now we are going more towards sound, you know, like TikTok, but also like, um, um, 
Clubhouse. Yes, thank you. Clubhouse, right? Like, I feel like that's so interesting that we didn't see this coming, that sound would play an important role, uh, um, you know, against image, let's say. Um, but yeah, I want to I wanna use this to tell you, like, my history on the internet, because it's really necessarily also my history as a writer, because... You know, I started writing um, at, at a very young age, maybe eight years old. Um, I published a few poems in like, you know, reader sections, as they call them. You send them to newspapers. But then the early 2000s, like we uh, started having the Internet, you know, it started entering people's homes or like even entering curriculum in, in across the Arab world. So I remember like my first, like my early literary experiences of speaking to people with different literary interests across the Arab world was through like these forums, right? Muntadeat. Um, and that was always beautiful, you know, like uh, people of different ages, of different uh, backgrounds. A lot of people also from, uh, you know, exiled people in, uh, in Europe and the US, you know? So um, that was my experience of, of, of like, found, like, let's say formational, uh, years. Um, so I used to publish in these forums. Then we started to have literary magazines, you know, uh, um, that are online. I, I used to, I was one of the founding uh, editors of a magazine called Apollo Wed. Um, uh, it's a beautiful magazine that was trying to, do, to bring visual arts and literature together. We maintained this for like maybe three years. Um, um, I, it was me, Manal Al they are Yusuf, they are Saudi artists. Um, and we had a radio, you know, like a, an, an online radio station where we played a lot of music, um, you know, so it, internet really gave me that community, you know, like where I can find people, um, you know, with very specific interests that I couldn't find in my immediate surrounding. But then maybe in the, in the late 2000s, like let's think like 2007, eight, uh, the internet became even more politicized of a space for, for young Arabs. Uh, I remember, you know, all kinds of forums, like atheist forums, you know, like the, uh, <laughs> like liberals, the leftists, all of them, you know, had their own spaces. Blogging became something, you know, um, especially after the Iraq war. Um, so I used to be a, an anonymous blogger when it comes to like some, some of the political spaces. Uh, but then when, 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 when the revolutions happened, I just felt like, you know, I was already a journalist in, in Kuwait, but I was not allowed to express my, my opinions. You know, they would, they were not even interested. They're like, oh no, you're a reporter, you know, you do what, what, what we tell you basically. But I was on, in the streets, you know, I was, I was like, like everyone else, I was 22. I was really like uh, angry and excited and, you know, I wanted to, um, expand on my ideas beyond just like a tweet right so um I started this blog and even though as I said like blogging just retreated I just felt like you know what I want to resist being that professionalized writer that you know has like this polished nice website you know <laughs> you know I was like I, I want to keep this you know I want to keep this like I don't know, again, like not polished, you know, just incomplete and, and real, I guess, in a way um, that represents someone of my generation. Um, so, uh, yeah. I, I absolutely love it. I find it to be um, uh, in, a, in a world of polish. Uh, I find it to be really, really um, refreshing. I want yeah. to talk a little bit about um, the Kuwait that you were born into. You were, you were born in Kuwait. Uh, for those of uh, the people listening and the people um, who may not be familiar with your work, um, you're often described as a stateless poet. Mm -hmm. um, you were born in Kuwait. You live in the U.S. right now. You studied in the U.S. Um, what does that What does that mean to be a to be a stateless Bedouin for somebody who doesn't know what that means? Yeah. Um... Well, I always say, you know, it's so difficult to like try to tell people what is exactly, you know, being stateless and especially that people have this question, why, why, why are you stateless, which is, you know, I find it a, an absurd question because, you know, how do you explain like state violence, I guess, you know, and, and, and nation violence. Um, but, you know, I would say like um, as a group, you know, as a community, we were born 
uh, uh, end result of the violence of the nation state, right? Like being founded. Uh, we did not at the beginning, you know, in the early in the early years, we did not really have a, a sense of being a group or, or being a community. We did not have uh, one cohesive identity or something. You know, we did not. Um, there wasn't even that narrative uh, uh, either on the side of the state or us. You know, it was just like, oh, this is the bureaucratic violence. These are uh, people who um, did not register, you know, as as like uh, in the records of the state, and then they were they were dropped from from that archive, I guess, um, and it it discontinued for for generations, right? Um, but of course, you know. Um, like um, being stateless in Kuwait, and and by the way, of course there are other stateless people in the Gulf and different histories, different contexts. But it's all like this again, this bureaucratic violence, you know, and um, excluding us, you know, as like uh, many of us come from certain tribes that are, you know, of the peninsula, and you know, um, don't only have connection to the land, but also have right in the land in the sense like this is oil rich uh, uh, land right so eliminating us is, is a way to eliminate our access to what should have been you know just like uh, um, um, you know natural rights uh, as a collective um, and over over decades you know this situation kept getting more worse and worse but for a long time up until the 80s you know the Bedouin thought like they are just like a, a, a temporary problem, like that this would be solved eventually, right? Uh, but the truth was that we were like uh, disposable, cheap, uh, un unregulated labor, you know, like they don't owe us any rights. We don't have labor rights. We don't have any documents. We don't have, you know, access to employment, healthcare, higher education, you, you name it. We are really ghosts. And, and, and I think there are other communities, you know, that know exactly what that experience means, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but I guess what really was a, a turning point for us is the Gulf War. You know, after the Gulf War, we were demonized and considered like as the mercenaries and as like the, the enemies within, you know, uh, we were framed as like, you know, um, the Bedouin used to come from different backgrounds. And, and as I said, some of us are like, you know, of, of you know, peninsula tribes. Uh, but after the Gulf War, we were framed as like only Iraqis and therefore, you know, um, like half half of the Bedouin were, were exiled to Iraq, you know, so um, there is well, like, something. Can, can I ask a basic question? Yeah. Um, so the the we that you're talking about, the, the Bedouin community that you're talking about, you're describing as it being a, a like a heterogeneous community, right? There's a lot. Yes. It's a it's a. Uh, different types of uh, types of people coming from different types of places, e even within the sort of modern day borders of this nation state. Yes. Um, but across what is now the GCC, these communities are also mm -hmm. all over all over the, the GCC. So basically after after the, the the Gulf War, there's this false homogeneity that emerges, right? Yes. As as a part of the, a narrative, you were three or four years old at the time. <laughs> yeah. At the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, is this something that you're finding out later, or I mean, you know, yeah. three year olds? I don't know if three year olds comprehend this type of stuff. But as a child, were you were you going to school with like a mixed school, so to speak, or were you going to school exclusively with folks like like you? Yeah. Well, yeah, um, um, this is one thing I wanted to get at, you know, it's like how my generation of Bedouin really experienced what it means to be Bedouin and uh, and to be like, you know, this enemy and to be excluded and to live in, in a very segregated society. That's something that my dad's generation didn't have to go through, you know? Um, so uh, I will tell you, you know, like, after 86, you know, this is when Kuwait, like all, all the Gulf countries uh, use the oil crisis to be like, you know what, we're going to segregate ev everything, we're going to make schooling, we're going to make everything, you know, for citizens and everyone else has to go to private, uh, uh, to the private sector. So suddenly we had like private schools that are cheap and uh, cater for Arab uh, 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 expats or like you know immigrants as well as the Bedouin and then of course there are other ones that for for non-Arabs you know like um, you, that's why we have Pakistani schools Indian schools you know that that kind of model emerged only in the 90s in the Gulf 
so yeah, I went to schools. I throughout my life, I really didn't even get to have any friends or interact with Kuwaitis. You know, it was that kind of segregated life in the '90s. So all my friends were either you know Egyptians, Palestinians, Syrians. You know, and I I was never you know I never had that talk what it means to be Bedouin. Like I know I'm Bedouin, but I don't know what the hell is that. You know, so like uh, I had to discover it you know by bits and even in random conversations. I remember telling people like, I I remember thinking when I was um, really like, uh, I don't know, five or six thinking that the Bedouin is a country, you know, (laughs) and we came from, you know, we have our country and we come just like, we're like, uh, you know, immigrants like everyone else. So I didn't have an idea of this and, and it took a long time to realize it and to realize like, oh, I don't have a passport, you know, or, or like, you know, like these things that you just take for granted and as, as a kid and don't, don't think like someone would deprive you of this, you know? And I will tell you something that, you know, of course the Arab revolution, like the Arab Spring, you know, like was such a beautiful time because it helped us. It it gave birth to that collective, right? Suddenly we found each other. We like, we are talking to each other and we're thinking like, yeah, what does this mean? What does it mean to be Bedouin? What is our experience? And, And that's why I always like push back against one narrative because there is no one identity for us, but there is like, um, you know, like an identity that contains multiplicity, let's say, you know, and, and I love this feeling and I felt, you know, empowered to like go back and question everything and, and, and like question like whatever our parents told us, whatever our society, like even our parents, like having to raise us after the Gulf War in a, in a atmosphere of so much fear and stigmatization it was hard to 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 know yourself right like so whatever you know about yourself is just like internalized like stigma and 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 inferiority and all of that so um even though my generation went through that terrible time we are also lucky to 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 go through this new process of like i feel like it's some kind of liberation and and self-discovery it's 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 really beautiful and um you know, like something that I will engage with throughout my life, I guess. Okay, so there's this quote that uh, from one from an article or an interview that you gave where you say, I resorted to literature again to save me and help me escape my reality. And I think you were describing a moment where you realized you weren't able to go to the public university. And so instead you needed to figure out a- another way to, um, to become educated. But the word resorted, Seemed, <laughs> seems interesting because like people like resort to drugs yeah. or people <laughs> resort to- Who was my drug, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like almost like it's an unhealthy relationship. What was your relationship with literature as a, as a child? You started writing and publishing when you were like eight, nine almost. Um, so uh, what was your relationship as a child? Who were you reading? What did you like? And why does it, why do you, are, do you use the word resorted? Yeah. Um, yeah, I will tell you, it's like, you know, like sometimes I, I look back at my like childhood and teenage years and I'm like, wow, I was such a nerd, you know, like I (laughs) didn't get to do, um, you know, other things much, you know? So, and I think this, this really influenced me that when I went to college, I was like, I need to go beyond literature, you know, I can't like just be that person, you know? And I did, you know, I was much more adventurous. I, got into politics and journalism and, and, and sports and all that. Um, but I want to tell you, I, you know, I really owe literature a lot because, you know, when I was a kid, I had a problem with the way as children, we were so domesticated and that we had no agency and everyone like decides for us everything, even like eating, sleeping, you know, I, I was so upset by it, you know, <laughs> even as a child, you know, so when I discovered that, you know, my father had a big, book collection you know at home like and his library you know I felt like some kind of liberation just like going there and like pulling books and reading you you were the writer as well right yes yeah and I felt um you know I felt like I I was able to be an adult but also like I had some kind (laughs) of freedom and I was uh like you know I I started feeling like yeah I'm better than these kids like this is boring, Barbies are boring, you know? <laughs> so uh, um, that feeling of empowerment and, but also you read these books and they are about like a different world, something you did never watch on TV, something that no adult will tell you about, you know? So I, 
I felt so hopeful that I can escape my reality. You know, like I really felt like, you know, life was dull. I, I generally say this, you know, like life in Kuwait is dull. <laughs> you know, it's very slow but and redundant and consumerist, you know. So literature was always a way for me to be to look outward. And, you know, the more I realized that, oh, I'm stateless, I don't have papers, you know, like that, you know, the literature played even a, a more powerful role in, in that sense. You know, I felt like I was always to escape, um, you know, and, 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 like just yeah be optimistic I, I think i'm generally an optimistic person um and uh and and to go back to that statement you know because literally you know when i finished high school i was shocked to you know like yeah i might not you know get an education um and then uh, uh there was this special like this private scholarship that a kuwaiti family put together and it was specifically meant to 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 um, fund artists slash writers, you know, who, who can go to public school. Um, so some of us are immigrants too, you know, we can go to public university. Um, and I got lucky to get this, this, this tuition ship and, and did my BA. So I was like, wow, literature really like saved my life in that sense. Right. Like gave me this, this new beginning, you know, and it's sad that it all has to be, be done on an exceptional basis, you know, but yeah. still like, um, I'm so grateful that, you know, uh, how poetry, like, come into my life in this way. Yeah. Um, I, I could talk to you about that phase of your life for a long time, but I want to move on. I, on the screen, I, I posted uh, the cover of the, the first two poetry collections that you published, first at the age of 14, the second at the age of 16. Um, before we move on to some of your more recent work, what is it like to revisit some of that work? Um, do you see sort of the DNA of your style and some of the things that you're dealing with? You're not writing about sort of rabbits and 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 bunnies, and yes. uh, you're writing about, I mean, heavy things. Um, do you still see? Do you still recognize yourself in in this work? Yeah, um, yeah. I I remember, you know, like for for a few years, like I never even dare to look at it, you know, I'm just like, oh, cringe, you know, like I don't want to look at this. Uh, but, um, you know, like I, I took the time to revisit it a few times, you know, especially actually thanks to people because I would randomly have people come to me and be like, oh my God, I found this book of yours, you know, you published the uh, like in 2004 and I fucking love it. And, you know, like they say, I don't like, wow, you like that, you know, because, you know, as a, as a writer, of course, you're so harsh on yourself and, 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 you know, like you're always trying to kill your older selves, you know, and to create new ones. Um, so um, be nice to that. Be nice to that. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I will tell you a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell you that I'm more, I'm much nicer to my, my child right now, you know, like, uh, um, I learned to how to, to embrace it and, and appreciate it and, and, you know, like, understand that, you know, we all have beginnings and how beginnings come, you know, to be something. So I will tell you when I read them, I see like that heavy influence of like the ideas I was reading, you know, all the intellectual stuff and, you know, like the lyrical poetry, the political poetry like I can see the echoes of that it's it, it's fresh in my mind when I read my books but at the same time um I'm amazed at like how like the raw imaginary of a child like comes into this right like you know like there's a lot of um yeah like the, there's a lot of freshness into it and, and how I bring that viewpoint into all these like as you said like they're very serious and 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 um engagements a lot of it is about like you know this existential question of like uh, of identity but a lot of it is also you know you know i'm talking about imperialism at the age 14 yeah. you know so you, you can see it's like a, a mix of things and I'm, I'm i'm proud to look back and see like be able to to find evidence of like how i was uh, you know my 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 conscious and 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 imagination was formulated it's beautiful to to have access to that yeah totally okay i want to i want to switch gears a little bit before we come back to your your more recent stuff uh, and talk about your work as a translator mm -hmm. um and I, I was reading this thing that you wrote about um some of the an experience you had with uh, wanting to self-translate right because um 
you, uh, which is not always true, I've, I've come to find out, you translate bo in both directions, into Arabic and out of Arabic. And, and, and you, you also write in, in Dutch or German? No, that was a translation. Someone that was a translation. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so you, you translate in and out of Arabic, which allows you to, to translate effectively, obviously, from Arabic to English. Um, but you were in this situation where you wanted to publish something um, and translate your own work. And, and in the piece, for those of you who can't see the screen, you said, as I come close to completing a decade in American exile, I have accumulated many examples of how monolingualism enacts the violent politics of the publishing industry and its literary apparatus. What is monolingualism? Yeah. Um, well, basically, monolingualism is, is you know, to, 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 is the phenomenon of, of imposing only one language and maintaining it. Yeah. Like, and, and, and of course, you know, uh, the publishing industry in the U.S. uses this um, excuse of like, yeah, this is the do dominant language, you know, but really it's a it's a it's a pretext to keep everything as it is, you know, elitist and, you know, you for you to be a writer, you go to an MFA and then you, you know, like that whole track of professionalization that also um, creates a certain type of writer that is unthreatening, you know, and, 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 you know, kind of predictable and easy to, to, uh, play with, I guess, you know? Yeah. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about my experience and yeah. because, you know, I'm really not the first Arab writer to come to this continent and, and face this question. You know, there were other writers before me who had to face this and we had, um, multiple solutions. Some, some people started to write in English. Some people, uh, um, you know, just like did self-translations. Like I, I want to say someone who started writing in English is Etiel Adnan uh, and she used to write in French. Uh, Sargon Bolas decided to self-translate himself and, uh, um, you know, wasn't successful in publishing. Uh, there was, you know, no, no space for him, even though he was like, uh, the big, like he was a friend of B generation. He translated them into Arabic. He, thanks to him, a lot of American poetry was translated into Arabic. You know that, like American poetry owes him in that sense. Um, and there were many other examples. Like right now, we have Sinan Antoun, like uh, as a contemporary who sometimes had to translate himself um, um, into English. You know, like a couple of his novels and i think all of these examples and i don't want to even give examples of other other languages you know in, in, into the us but all these examples tell you you know how much like the exiled writer has no space uh, is not welcomed and uh we are only summoned when they want to talk about us uh, they, they want us to talk about exile right mm -hmm. so we are always like uh, uh ghettoized in, into this like these labels and maybe Exile now is is falling out of uh, a fashion. So now they're telling us, oh, talk about being a refugee, you know, talk about, you know, uh, refugee literature. And even, you know, even though like someone like me or um, I was uh, from this essay that you pulled from, I was reviewing Ribka, Ribka Subhatu, who is an Eritrean uh, poet. I, I really love her. Imagine she writes in four or five languages, you know, and she is someone like I learned from because, you know, she... She didn't just decide to write and then she was exiled, you know, and she, she like recreates herself with every language. Sometimes in the same poem, she writes in two, three languages, you know? So I'm like, you know what? Refugee literature is actually um, very promising, you know, because it stands against national literature. It stands against monolingualism, you know, it's so inventive and, and has to recreate itself. And just like the refugee, you know, the refugee is always looked at as a tragic figure, but really it's a very hopeful figure. You know, you yeah. cross continents, you know, you're, you're so brave, you know, you're the new, new tra traveler, new flaneur, you know, and no one yeah. wants to give you that credit. Of course, you, they want to still want to pity you in, in a sense. For sure. I want to under, I want to talk a little bit about your project to translate Octavia Butler's um, novel Kindred, um, and and in particular, I, I'm curious about how much African American literature um, is translated into Arabic, um, and sort of I don't know if you describe her, uh, this book in particular as being revolutionary, but sort of mind opening. Um, uh, a mind-opening uh, literature coming from the African-American tradition born out of 
um, the oppression and the hope and the hopefulness that these books are being written with. How much of it is translated into Arabic and why did you choose this book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is something I would I would I would love to like, you know, engage with and for years to come, you know, because um, after I came to the States and, 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 you know, I have much more access to reading in English and was doing it much more than reading in Arabic, you know, of course, like grad school, all of that. Um, and then I just started to realize, I'm like, wow, like we, it's so sad how translation uh, 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 does not resist uh, the hierarchy that, you know, is, is in the first domain in the sense like, a lot of the writers we get translated from English are necessarily Western, even though English is not, you know, only in the West. And a lot of the writers get translated are white and, and white men or older white men, you know. And uh, of course, I'm someone who has like so many favorites, like white male writers. I, I don't I don't believe in like rejecting that. Uh, but I also believe like, you know, that like maintains a certain status quo of literature and also like makes us experience literature in a very certain way so like one beautiful thing i learned from a lot of uh, um you know not only black american literature uh, but you know so many other literatures is that you know our stories um can be made into into um you know like a bigger bigger experience to, experiences to share reflect on process you know like in the sense Octavia Butler uses this very difficult experience such as slavery, but she is able to make, to bring this into a, a bigger conversation on oppression and on humans resisting and on how do we look on past oppressions? How do, do they come in conversation uh, uh, with that uh, humans in, in the present moment? You know, these are like about temporality, about like imagination, how, how do we resist linearity of history? You know, like these are big questions that I couldn't find much in in white literature if we if if we call it right and i love how someone like uh, octavia butler is able to bring in uh, elements from sci-fi and 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 use them to write a historical novel um and you know she uses travel literature she, it's amazing to me she uses a slave narrative as a way of writing travel literature like how powerful that is you know to to think of the uh, enslaved escaping as a way of traveling as well. Like, yeah, so much, you know, so much in there. So I want to tell you, um, it's really sad how uh, every time we translate uh, Black American literature, and, you know, I, I'll just focus on this, uh, uh, you know, s- since that's our conversation, because there are many examples, but we always translate it because there was some moment happening, like Toni Morrison winning Nobel Prize. Oh, we can translate a lot of like Black women writers. You know, in the 60s, of course, because um, radical black uh, uh, um, thought and we had decolonization. So a lot of translation happened. Um, Now Black Lives Matter, there's more translation, you know. So I think this is good, you know, but I think we need to make this more of a translation practice. I think we as translators need to be critical and think of like, you know, yeah, we, we don't have so much power, but we are also gatekeepers in a way, you know, like we are made to facilitate so much uh, and and we need to realize this power in a sense yeah that, that's so that's so true it's it's almost like it's like you it's like you are um it's like you're the the janitor in the school that has like four thousand keys and can like right. open every single door at the school <laughs> you know? yes. yeah like you can yeah. unlock you can unlock all this stuff but I, i'm curious why this book in particular mm-hmm. yeah um I, okay, so I thought, uh, going back to that point, I love that she brought different aesthetic into the historical novel, into this like political subject, because now in in contemporary Arabic literature, people have been uh, doing a lot of historical novels. Uh, Mm -hmm. People have been interested in in our, uh, like the history of the Islamic empire and Indian ocean slavery, um, and in, in, in race and blackness and, and also let's say in general marginalized, you know, groups and their histories. I feel like a lot of novel- novelists are taking, you know, they're like throwing themselves at this and some of it can be opportunistic and some of it is genuine, but the, the truth is like 
can you present something that is that you know grasp things by the roots that make people look at history different that makes us you know like uh, help that figure of let's say the enslaved emerge in a different way beyond victimization beyond you know like uh, uh trying to assimilate them or compromise them you know so from my research on 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 uh, like contemporary Arab, uh, arabic novel i saw a lot of um uh like good attempts but a lot of failure and i was like you know what i i think translation can come here and intervene and tell them like look sometimes all you need is 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 aesthetic and a vision you know you need a political vision that tells you like yeah you can talk about slavery but you can bring this into a, a bigger conversation on oppression and how do you not compromise the the person who experienced that violence right like how do you that help that figure emerge and speak for itself and and you know like shake history in a way right and and shake it into the present it's not just something done in, in back in the past yeah um okay so i i want to take how that sort of operating um ethos may have led to the decision to to um translate um instructions within um which was Sid, which was the other direction um, and so what led to the, that decision um, to translate um, Ashraf Fayyad's uh, book from Arabic to English? Yeah, um, with, with Ashraf, it was like a very specific moment, you know, and I think we can look at it also in the framework of the, of the, of the Arab Spring, you know, we suddenly, like say 2013, 2014, we suddenly had like tens of artists and writers locked up in, in across the Arab world, you know, uh, it was heartbreaking. And, and I felt, me personally and a lot of my friends felt so drained that we just couldn't do anything, you know, we felt hopeless. There were, uh, as you know, like in places like Syria and Egypt, there were literally thousands and thousands of people disappearing and, 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 and you know, uh, getting locked up, you know, so like, there wasn't much like uh, we can do, especially us in, in, in exile. Who are we? You know, like we really don't have much power beyond our words. And so I suddenly found myself like I had a friend uh, in Bahrain that was uh, two friends, actually, that were locked up and, and then got out of prison. I had a friend, Ahmed Naji in Cairo. Same thing he, for, for being a writer, for publishing an explicit novel. You know, and Ashraf Fayal, the same thing, you know, they 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 conspired against him to be like, oh, he was writing blasphemous poetry, even though this book was published in 2008, imagine, you know, so like there is some kind of conspiracy against him that emerged years later because he was uh, opinionated, you know, politicized, you know, he didn't shy away in a, in a country like Saudi Arabia where you know, now Saudi Arabia is so politicized and, and it's amazing like how people uh, have been organizing, but imagine before the Arab Spring, you know, like it was fucking, you know, dead silence, right? So um, so that is the kind of person Ashraf is. And he was someone on the ground, like uh, uh, creating spaces for visual art and, 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 and you know, like uh, theater and all that, you know, so I feel like he was targeted for beyond even the text, right? Like for being that active person that, you know, uh, like who, who made things happen. So um, um, I decided, you know, like there was a lot of interest in, in Ashraf, but I was like, listen, he is not just a prisoner, which is like not, not to re reduce, you know, political detainees, you know, we admire them and, 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 you know, like I have so much respect for them, but, I was like, we need to engage with his work too. You know, like that's the only way that at distance we can do something, right? Like, so I took uh, the book and I translated it and it was so beautiful, Mikey, because like there were people uh, like literally from 20 different languages who didn't speak Arabic and used my translation as a way to translate his work. And suddenly we had like readings and translations and publications across the world who were engaging with Ashraf's work because you know, we, we thought like, you know what, translation is not only about uh, reading a text and enjoying it. It's, it's also about like, how do we come together and how do we organize and how do we, you know, uh, uh, stand up for each other, you know, as, as a community. And unlock, unlock uh, the work. If, if, if unable to unlock the prison cell, unlock the work. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's um, do the quick Q&A, then we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, Okay, so what are you reading or watching right now? 
Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I am, uh, I'm reading uh, uh, In Memory of Memory by Maria Stepnova. I hope I'm not saying this wrong. Um, she is um, a major contemporary Russian poet, but this is her first piece. I think this is her first uh, uh, work of fiction. And it's so beautiful. Uh, it's it's uh, I, it's beautiful because you know she's like writing about the process of trying to write the novel. Imagine so you get in the process and then she tells the novel. Yeah, so it becomes like part memoir, part uh, uh, fiction, and also a little bit of uh, um, nonfiction. She reflects on photography, you know, and so I I, I love that it's a genre b- bending, as they say. Uh, I'm enjoying it. As for watching a lot of Ramadan. So I don't know if you want to hear about this. <laughs> um, okay, good. Is there one Musalsa that you definitely want to shout out? Um, yes, I think that the two that everyone agrees are amazing are Asr and Neil and Lubet Newton. And uh, <laughs> I like and, how I said I like how I said one, and you're like the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just like I think it's just I, I think I love them because I feel like for a long time we didn't have good TV script in Arabic, you know. Um, and I think this is this is like yeah, like, this is good writing. Okay, I think you figured out your next translation project. Okay, um, <laughs> who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Uh, wow, <laughs> shadow for a day. Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's it, because sh- to shadow is kind of creepy, no? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm answer. sorry. No answer. That's a great answer. Okay, um, <laughs> what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, yeah, I I misunderstand. Okay, I would say you know, uh, for example, I I would say that, um, for example, I noticed this. A lot of people describe my poems um, as um, simple language, you know, which is true actually, you know, because I and and I think this comes from from uh, the practice of the Arabic prose poem in general, you know, because the Arabic prose poem was like. We don't want to be lyric, lyrical. We don't want to be like, you know, eloquent. We just want to write in this everyday language. Um, so yeah, I, I think the misunderstanding happens in the sense that uh, this is intentional and this is about like bringing you into whatever, you know, settings and sceneries I'm trying to draw uh, that are actually, a lot of the times are very quiet, but uh, hold some anxiety and something disturbing about them. Uh, and the last question, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure there are many, but if there is one. Um, yeah, I would say, um, I think someone that I always return to, right, is, is, is definitely Atila Dan, because, you know, like, you know, God bless her, she's in her 90s and she's done all kinds of writings and lived many places and genres and languages, you know, so like, I feel like, Many times, any question I have, I just return to her. I find some kind of answer. And then and then decided to become an artist at like age 70. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> and, and, and become successful, right? Yeah. Um, OK, let's do the quick Q&A, uh, the audience uh, questions. We're going to start with Catherine. Are you there? Yep, I'm there. OK, go ahead. Hi, Mona. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I heard you talk a few weeks ago about um, a variety of things, including Kuwaiti fiction, and you mentioned um, a book I love, which is Ismail Fahed's Fi Hadrat al Anqa wal Khil al Wafi. And you said it very much reinforced stereotypes of the Bidun, wasn't particularly reflective of their realities. Are there writers that you do like who do write about Bidun issues uh, mm-hmm. more effectively? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um... I will tell you, okay, so it was, um, I wouldn't say only that it's stereotypical, but also I was trying to say how much like the Bedouin characters are always used as, as, as you know, allegories and, and figures that have to carry so much like political sentiments and messages, right? So I was like, I, I feel like we need Bedouin characters that are multidimensional, that are not like flat, that, are, that have more like flesh and soul to them, that, you know, are not predictable, that are not necessarily, you know, 
like uh, free of contradictions because you know like they of course they are of contradictions and they they don't have to be cohesive and figured out everything so this is what i feel like we lack uh, in the in the few really a few Bidun characters that would have been written so far um i if you remember from my talk i mentioned uh, Ismail and Saud Sanusi and Thayna Al Isa as like the Kuwaiti writers who did it but then there are the Bedouin writers like Nasr Dafiri and Kat Karim and Hazar. Um, and I feel, um, you know, even though that Bedouin writers themselves might fall in the same issue, you know, with the same issue, with the same trap, but there is at least, you know, they come from much more uh, uh, knowledge and, and, and uh, they have sat with this experience much longer. So you will notice that their characters are more complex. So um, I don't know if you had the chance to read Karim Hazar or Nasr al but I, I think, you know, uh, you, you might find something appealing in them. Um, and I love that, you know, in the stories of, of Karim Hazar, for example, you will find um, that the Bedouin character, you know, is has that question of like being Bedouin always on the mind, but at the same time, they have other engagements like, um, how do I, how they are concerned with, with, with politics in the region or like, uh, uh, being a family and how does the family survive or, you know, trying, you know, so there's like multiple concerns, uh, even, even like the taste of the character, the character doesn't necessarily have to like only Kuwaiti music and only Kuwaiti food as of like asserting their identity. No, like the character likes Asmahan or likes, you know, like this, this random movies, random um, singer, you know, so like, that's what I mean about like, uh, we we really lack these characters, you know, and I hope there's more to them. And there's, I feel like the Bedouin writers have had better attempts so far, you know, um, and I hope for more. Thank yeah, you. perfect. Um, great. Uh, Rayel, you're up next. Okay, I'm going to read her question for you. Um, she said, I, I saw and heard you a couple years ago at Shabak Festival of London after reading, quote, Going Beyond the Veil Against the Regime of Aib by Dina Munzid from Lebanon. She is from Lebanon. I would like to ask you uh, kindly to share with us your thoughts of Aib. Is it somewhere in your writing while you write? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, I love Dina, by the way. I love Dina's work. Yeah. Um, I will say, okay. About time, yeah, of course. I mean, I think I think if you read any of my poems, and you mentioned Shubak Festival, because I I I think that was a time where I actually read a poem, uh, you know, several poems in 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 that direction, you know, and also like I'm always aware of like yeah, like the woman body in 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 let's say Arab society, like that's an experience that you know created me, right? But then also like what it means to be to have this, to be a woman in the West where my, my body is racialized as well. Like, you know, being, being Arab and, uh, um, you know, specifically I use uh, airports as a way of reflecting actually, you know, of like, I remember how, that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I heard <Yes>. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I wanted to say, um, I guess what I want to say is that, you know, um, I feel like I, you know, it's like, uh, just one name to 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 that experience of like how women are policed and and really I don't want to say only women but like of course women in a in a in a like a very gendered way right like and and, and sometimes racialized way if you if you um, you know if you are not like uh, white passing or white right so I feel like uh, that's something I always have it in my poems in the background or in the details you know I I sometimes try to. Like in one poem, I remember it's called my, my body is my vehicle, you know, and I'm trying to like actually like hijack my body from <laughs> from the society, from the gaze and, and think of it as more as a vehicle that takes me around the world every day and how like this vehicle sometimes breaks down and sometimes like goes places, you know. So, um, yeah. And, and so I feel like it's it's everywhere in my in my poetry, but also, as you can tell, like I am. Um, you know, a feminist and it's in my scholarship and it's in my translation uh, work, it's, it's everywhere, you know, like that I, um, I, I, I try to address this, this, this stigma, but also like imagine a different future for us, like a, a world where we can be like, you know, like be ourselves and be like, how does freedom feel? Like, I always ask this question. I'm like, I don't want writers to tell me how 
uh, only like how oppression feels right now. I also want them to imagine freedom for me. I want to be like, oh yeah, that's how freedom feels. Like how beautiful, right? Like I can work toward that in a way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Bethana, you're up next. Hi, uh, hi Mikey, hi Mona. Thank you so much. There's so much, I um, so many questions, but I wanted to ask you about your, uh, thoughts or opinions about, um, you know, translation of Arabic to uh, Malayalam or South Asian languages more broadly. Um, I'm just thinking of, you know, works like Odu uh, Jipitam, which is uh, Ayam, which is translated into Ayam al uh by Benjamin, or, uh, you know, I, I mean, we've seen it in film as well, um, like the banning of uh, Gaddama by, ben, by uh, the director, the Malayalam director Kamal. Um, and how much that you know furthers the kind of relation, the isolationism of uh, of South Asian writers um, living in the Gulf. Thank you, Buthena. Thank you, um, and thanks for joining us. Um, I want to say, yeah, I, I I I got to discover this really in the past few years because of my work in translation. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like we have almost four million speakers of Malayalam in, in the Gulf but barely any books like uh, the first book we ever heard of is like Gold Days, uh, Ayam al Ma'is, and it was uh, banned in some countries and, you know, uh, but it also like was a, a, a very successful uh, book. So I started to dig more into this, but also like I began to uh, um, uh, have conversations with um, Malayalam scholars and writers, you know, some of them don't necessarily write in Malayalam, but study it, you know, um, basically people who live in South India or in the Gulf, but from South India. Um, and I was amazed to know, like, you know, how much, even though, like, the Gulf and, and South India have a millennia of, of, of history and interaction, um, uh, all that cultural exchange has been limited to religion, you know, like uh, Islamic scholars or people come to the Gulf and uh, get a degree in Sharia and go back, you know, it's, it's very limited, you know, so only now, I think for our generation that we was, we see a few people in academia and translation doing this connection. And I think it's, it's not a coincidence that the first translations between like into Malayalam and from Malayalam into Arabic have been of novels and poetry. And I, I, I really think this is so beautiful uh, uh, of a coincidence and, and says something about how literature pushes boundaries and, you know, creates uh, uh, like unlikely connections in, in a way. So, um, and, and I wanna say like, I personally, like right now I'm working with uh, uh, Ibrahim Bacha, who is like based in, uh, at the University of uh, Delhi and also with uh, um, uh, Dr. Mohammed Shafiq, he works in, in, at the university in, I forgot the name of the university, but also in Kerala. And also uh, the translator, Ibrahim Sahil Rafi, who, who is of God Days. And I'm working with them. I'm like, you know, let's start with having written conversations where we talk about the future of this lit literary uh, uh, movement. Because also I'm thinking like, you know, uh, maybe we need to imagine Gulf literature also beyond Arabic, right? What if Gulf literature is something that is written by different languages and how does translation help us imagine such a such a, a, transna a transnational vision of literature in that region. Great question. Um, thanks, Mona. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. So good to see so many people here and hear such great questions. We have another talk, another conversation on this Thursday with Karim and Kristal from the Mufladat team. If you don't know about Mufladat, um, it'll be a really fun conversation talking about the sort of um, the contours of the culture scene in, um, uh, across the Arab world and of the Arab world. So uh, join for that. And this recording will be out next week. So if you want to go back and listen to some of the sections that you may have missed um, and feel free to share with your friends. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. And uh, good to see you all here. Have a good one. Bye.